Our boys are really little and I'm afraid that they're not going to remember much. So I wanted them to have a story that they can look back at for years to come. And I also, I don't know, I wanted to show other people what foster care and adoption could look like. I think when I was younger it meant like saving a kid from some horrible existence or something. It's taking on a kid forever, you know, until you're going to raise them and provide for them until they're 18 at least and part of your family whether you had them biologically or not. I wanted to be a mom my whole life. <laughs> you know, other kids knew that they wanted to be a teacher or an astronaut. I knew that I wanted to be a mom. Being a mom is, is having people depend on you and always being able to be there for them and, and raising them well to trust God, number one, and to be good to other people. My mom's awesome. <laughs> and, and she just loved being a mom and I saw that and I wanted that for myself. We'd only been dating for a little bit, and I said, do you want to have kids? Because, <laughs> you know, it's really important to me. And you were like, I don't know. <laughs> and you were playing it off as, like, this cool guy thing. And I remember going to the bathroom, and I was like, well, I don't know if this is going to work out. <laughs> it about broke us up at first, probably. <laughs> that subject. <laughs> I was just very neutral on it. I could go one way or the other. Yeah, it'd be great to have kids. But on the other hand, it, well, I didn't have this deep desire yeah. that, that I you know, really wanted my own children and needed my own children. And at one thought I was like, oh, it'd be great to have kids and have a bunch of me, you know, running around. <laughs> as much as Meredith wanted to have children, then I wanted to give that to her. Well, I think a couple years into our marriage, Matt finally said, okay, we can start trying to have kids. So, you know, we tried and it was month after month of not getting pregnant and then people around us started getting pregnant very quickly. It's torturous because you think that you might be and then you're not and then you think, well, what's wrong with me? And I know the, the date actually, but we figured out something needed to change. Um, it was the day that one of my good friend's daughter was born because I thought I was pregnant. And I came home and found out that I wasn't. And it was one of my best friends, you know, having her first baby and I just lost it because I couldn't feel any joy for her. And Matt came home and found me collapsed on the floor, cuddling our dog and just sobbing. She was just devastated because it wasn't happening. So it was frustrating. I mean, it was such a burning desire for Meredith, so it was a lot more emotional for her not being able to, to get pregnant and knowing that it, it would be her child. Then we looked into adoption, um, both domestic and international. I liked that idea, but there was kind of a time constraint on that. It was gonna be you know, two to three years before we'd have a kid in our house. And I wanted kids now. <laughs> And Matt said, why don't we do foster care? And I had never even considered it. But he had a foster brother growing up. And it was actually a pretty hard experience, I think. And for him to still want to do that, I think spoke really highly of foster care. That's when we started to look into adoption. Went to an informational meeting, I think, and found out more about adoption and within the state of Minnesota, but also international adoption. And come to find out, adopting a, a child is fairly expensive. It's, um, I think at the time to adopt uh, domestically or in state in the state of Minnesota was going to be anywhere from like fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars, and then it would just go up from there as you went international. After we learned that, we thought, well, maybe there's other alternatives out there. Of course, foster parenting was another thing, but then, you know, there's so many stereotypes behind fostering children. Having these strangers come into your home that you don't know, and, and what kind of baggage do they have, and how messed up are they, and are they going to burn my house down and do drugs on my kitchen table? <laughs> those, were, those were the scary thoughts I had about fostering for the first time. I thought it'd be a good alternative to, to having kids and, and maybe there would be that rare chance at one point that we would be able to adopt a kid if, if, if everything worked out right. So we started that process and then, and then of course I had a job change and had the opportunity to basically get a job where I grew up in my hometown, Rapid City. Every state runs their 
fostering processes differently. So we, we had to start over and take classes here in the state of South Dakota in Rapid City. And, you know, it's one of those things where they put your life under a microscope. And not only do you do training sessions 30 hours in a classroom, but they come into your home and interview you. And what was your life like growing <laughs> up? And What's somewhat... your relationship like? Well, yeah, you, you who's, go through. Who's good at what? Like, what are Matt's strengths? What are Meredith's strengths? What are your weaknesses? They said that I would have a hard time letting the kids go. They were right. Well, <laughs> well, you know, you get attached to children very quick, and the day they have to leave, they have to leave. Yeah. And you have no say in it, so that is probably the hardest part about being a foster parent. My particular situation is pretty messy. I, I had parents that were divorced at, uh, when I was really young. You know, they dove right into my family history right away and it was deep and, and it, it gets emotional. I mean, they're asking you emotional questions and, and want to know how you were brought up and if you're going to be capable of, of handling, you know, the kids that are coming into your home. And they do home inspection. They actually come in and, and look in every room and check the water temperature. <laughs> It makes sure your your hot water is not too hot. Sure, you have you have all your outlet covered. You gotta, yeah, <laughs> every outlet covered. <laughs> every chemical in the house has yeah. to be basically locked up, and if it isn't, you have to put the little uh, cabinet locks on all your cabinets. So they're going through quite an extensive evaluation, both in the home and on you, to make sure you're qualified to do it, which is a good thing. You're going through these classroom sessions and they're trying to tell you all the things you're going to encounter so you, you get to see firsthand all the stereotypes that everybody thinks. And they're trying to prepare you for the worst kids even though you'll, you won't necessarily have a lot of that but they're trying to prepare you. A lot of times, you know, people like to make generalized statements or blanket statements about kids that you might get in foster care or what you might encounter, but when it comes down to it, it's like every kid in every case is so different. And the goal for kids in foster care is to put them back with their family. That's plan A, and only when plan A fails is when you look to adoption and or kinship, placement, things like that. We support the goal. We want kids to be with their families, and yeah, you get attached that's good. You want kids to attach to you. <laughs> I don't think that's a reason to not do foster care because you're gonna get hurt. It's very difficult, you know. It's it's hard to be able to give the kids back <laughs> and it can be a very re rewarding thing. Yeah, I think it's easier than a lot of people think. The majority of these kids, they're such great kids and all they need is good guidance and love. Consistency. And yeah, yeah, structured consistency in a home. They just need their basic needs and, and the love that you can provide in a household. So we were living in Minneapolis at the time and we got all of our paperwork in, went to all the informational meetings, just had signed up for classes, got approved for everything where they start the process. So everything takes quite a while in Minneapolis. And then Matt gets a job in Rapid City. <laughs> so we had to move and we moved in with his mom. You know, we were living in somebody else's house and so we didn't really pursue foster care then. And, and they came back from a trip and they had been discussing us, I guess. And they said, hey, if you guys want to fill the house up with kids, go ahead. <laughs> and so we said, okay. And within two days, somebody was in our house giving us information and so I, I think within like six months we had kids in our house. And so we said okay well we only want kids from the ages of zero to ten and they were fine with that. But we at first said we'd only like two and then we got a phone call that was like hey <laughs> do you want to take the sibling group of four kids? And I was like what? We said we only wanted two <laughs> which isn't you know it's not about me. And I call Matt and I'm like what do you think about this? They have, they have four siblings, like should we just take two? And he goes, well, I don't want to split up a sibling group. So we got four kids for our first placement, but they were awesome. Right. They were great kids. So we got Dominic Interesting in July um, of 2014. And they came into care because Dominic was found wandering a highway by himself and he was two and a half. And so they were actually placed into a foster home for 
a couple weeks with um, another family where it was determined that that family said, you know what, they need somebody that, that's going to stay at home with them full time. So the mom was going to go back to work when school started. So she said, nope, they need to be with a full time um, stay at home mom. So that's when we got the phone call that we had these two little boys and they didn't know much about the older one. He was nonverbal. The foster mom dropped them off, and I remember the first time I saw them. You weren't here, were you? You were at work. My mom was here. Yeah, and that's right. Your mom was yeah, here. my mom was here, and I remember seeing Tristan looking out of his car seat, just kind of looking around. The foster mom picked up Dom out of the car, and she turned him, turned him, and he looked at me, and he just opened his arms and like jumped into my arms, and it was, it felt so great. So my mom was here when the boys um, were placed with us and I remember being really overwhelmed because Dom couldn't communicate and Tristan was, I mean, a 15 month baby. He was a good kid, but he would like scream all night. Of course he would, you know, we were strangers. And I was just feeling the new parent overwhelmed feeling. And my mom looked at me and said, if you think that you can't handle them, you need to give them back right now. And my, just like this protective, Mama Bear welled up in me and was like, of course I can handle it. No, they're staying. I'm not going to let them leave. And I knew right then that like I was committed to them. That was in July, and they didn't termina terminate parental rights until March. And that was the first time that our social worker used the A word with me. <laughs> she was very careful not to use it before that because she knew it would, it would give me hope that wasn't wasn't warranted at that point. At that point she said, okay, now we're gonna look at all the other family members and see if any of them are interested and are you interested in adopting them? Possibly, if none of those family members work out. I said, well, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course we are. So it took months and months and months and months, a whole year, it took one year for them to rule out any other family that was interested. So it came down to us and another family of theirs that were interested. South Dakota is a family preference state, so that means that if there are any next of kin that are suitable, then the kids will most likely go with, with them. So it looked like our chances were um, pretty slim. The family backed out in March, and so it was a long transition from foster care to adoption, with a whole year of us just hoping and praying that they could stay. <laughs> Not even for me, because yes, I want I wanted to be a mom so badly, and I was. And even then, even before we knew we were able to adopt them, I felt very fulfilled as a mother. Even if we wouldn't have been able to keep them, I still would have felt fulfilled. And it was about them. I, I, I felt like if they were gonna leave, it would be really horrible for them to leave because Dom didn't attach to anybody before me. And Tristan, at that point, knew nobody but us as his parents. It would have been terribly traumatic for them to have to go live with people, even if they were relatives. So I was really worried about them for a whole year. <laughs> it was a long year. They're two very different people, I feel like. Tristan is just this like happy-go-lucky kid. As much as he'd been through or, or the things that he'd been through as far as neglect or being put into the foster care system, he was a little more bulletproof, like he could deal with things a lot easier. He had this personality that everybody liked and like he, he knew how to deal with people, you know? And he was yeah. just like this little charmer from the beginning, which yeah. he still is today. He was difficult because he didn't like me very much because he was used to a male taking care of him most of the time. So I couldn't comfort him and that was really hard. You have night terrors and you can't do anything about those. and. I wasn't a comfort to him until I just kept putting him in the front pack and we would just go for walks in the grocery store or where, whatever, he would just be right here and we finally bonded. He would walk up to a stranger and let him pick him up. Any man that had a hat on, Tristan would just walk up and let him pick him up. He was so used to having his biological father watch over him and take care of him, that's basically all he knew. And then for Meredith to come in and be this motherly figure, he didn't know what to do and, and didn't really bond with Meredith for quite a while. But it was less than a week after they came. Matt came home from work and Tristan looks down the hallway and goes, Dada? Yeah. And he saw you. It wasn't like he thought his dad was coming. He saw you and said, Dada. And we were like, what? Okay. And we just rolled with it. So they started calling you Dada. And Dom called me Bob. 
He would walk around the house going, Bob, yeah. Bob. <laughs> His little mom, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, because they only had um, a handful of words each when they came. Like, uh-oh, no, mama, dada, and then peekaboo, which sounded like, good to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was peekaboo. <laughs> they, they spoke their own little language together. Dominic is just such a different kid than Tristan in the fact that you can tell that he had to just fend for himself a lot more. He would go scrounging for food. And we'd find him running down the gravel road, wandering around, because that's what he was used to doing. So that was interesting. And then, of course, not, him not being able to talk, uh, he just could not hardly say any words and couldn't communicate what he, what he wanted and what he needed, we basically learned that he'd never really talked to anybody or been spoken to or learned how to talk from anyone. And so that was just really hard. Probably the good six months before he really started learning how to talk. Even though he was behind verbally, he was ahead in other ways. Like he knew his alphabet by the time he was three. Like he could rec correctly recognize all the letters. Dom um, was really protective of Tristan. He would share his food with him, and only him. And um, we would find Dom outside looking for food. Sorry. And he would go and like drink water off the ground. Um, and he would take food and put it up to his mouth like this, and hold it there and smell it, and like touch it to his lip to make sure that it was okay before he'd eat it. He would see us preparing food and he would scream until he got some. And he wasn't malnourished because he was like 50 pounds as a two-year-old, <laughs> but he just didn't have access to good food all the time. They would watch you preparing it and see it and just, they wanted it right now. Yeah. Like, because they were so used to probably just any food that was around, you had to eat it right now. And so to cook a meal in front of them was like crazy. Like they didn't know what to do with that. So they would just sit there and scream. And that went on for at least a few weeks until they realized that, oh, over time you cook the food and then you eat it. <laughs> they trusted us eventually that we were gonna feed them. As soon as Dom started talking and having like some more vocabulary, we found out that one of his biggest worries was that mommy would go. Anytime any character in a book was sad, it would be because his mommy left. He was really worried. We could deal with that. I'm not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> that was one reason I think Dominic was maybe placed into our home is because Meredith didn't work. You know, he needed a home where there was gonna be somebody around all the time. You weren't just gonna put him in daycare. He needed to form that attachment and right. build a relationship where he could attach to someone. Yeah, and there were developmental things that he didn't get. Like, he didn't get skin to skin when he was younger because after a while we found out he needed it and he would put his hands on me for months I had to lay with him to put him to sleep and he would put his hands on my you know on my skin and that's just something that he needed because he didn't get it when he was a baby. It was amazing how quickly Dom and Tristan got attached to us and started to really thrive. Like two weeks after we got them we took a 10 day road trip to Oregon. We didn't know who they were, they didn't know who we were, <laughs> but we went to bed together, we woke up together, and we traveled all day together. I think that was huge in their, in their attachment to us, like, oh, they're not going to be gone when I wake up. Do you want to be Dominic Fister? Yeah. <laughs> Christy called and said, that we get to change your name to Dominic Fister and Tristan Fister. What do you think about that? Yeah! Mm -hmm. Yay! Fister boys! Yeah. Woo! No. What do you want to be? I want to be Dom Fister. <laughs> you want to be Dom Fister? <laughs> Oh, 
come to order. This is the time and place set in the matter of the adoption of the case of Mendoza, Tristan Mendoza. This is Butte County Adoption File 16-2. It is case in front. Yes. Um, Matt and I just want to extend our gratitude to everyone who's been involved, all of the workers um, who acted swiftly and with compassion um, and really looked, for the best, looked out for the best interest of our kids. I was just going to say, uh, uh, just very impressed with all parties DSS, the court system, all the workers have been involved. It's just a lot of support from everybody. Thank you. It is therefore ordered that the minor children be and are hereby are the adopted children of Matthew and Meredith Mister, and shall be regarded and treated in all respects for forever <laughs> as their children. It is further ordered that Kaysen Dobbs and be changed to Dominic Matthew Fister. It's further ordered that Tristan's name shall be changed to Tristan Isaac Fister. This court further orders and directs the university to be issued in all those comfort of Thank you, Two kids, like yeah. forever. <laughs> it was just a whirlwind. Yeah. Of, like all these emotions. Yeah. Crying. And yeah. And... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the best feeling ever. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm so happy we have so much support. Yeah. Friends and family. Thank yeah. you all. This is mm. awesome. <laughs> now yeah. we get to go celebrate. Yeah. <laughs>